right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm uh, really excited to be hosting the 229th Governance and Risk Call here at MakerDAO. My name is Peyton. I go by Pros11 Online, and I am one of the governance facilitators. I'm joined by a bunch of awesome Maker contributors, uh, other ecosystem actors, and, and people who are interested in how the Maker system has functioned. Uh, yeah, and this is our weekly governance and risk call. If you're a first timer, this might be new, so pay extra attention. But uh, for you seasoned folks, I'm sure you've heard this feel before. Uh, this is an open call, right? We really do encourage people's participation, questions, comments, uh, surfacing debate that we can then revisit later on the forum. Uh, so a few ground rules that will help us achieve that. Uh, let's avoid talking over one another. Use reactions such as the uh, raise hand feature to let me know if you want to hop on the mic. And also always just drop your uh, question and comment in the chat. And I'll try to work it in when conversationally appropriate. Um, I'll try to introduce you. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I don't recognize your Zoom avatar name. Uh, so if you haven't been introduced, uh, if you can help me out and do that, that'll make it easier both for people that don't know you uh, and for anyone watching later on the recording. And yeah. Please, really do ask questions. This is um, meant to be an open call. As usual, we'll start with going over the votes and what is happening in the land of MIPS. Uh, then we're going to hear a brief uh, voter portal security update uh, from, from Ducks. And uh, our discussion topic today is going to be pretty open-ended, uh, basically just giving people a chance to ask questions uh, about the big maker constitution MIPS set that's uh, set to go up a vote on Monday. Um, so. If we exhaust that, if there are other questions, we can get into that as well. Um, but uh, my intention is kind of just to hold space and make sure everyone is able to uh, ask questions before this gets on chain on Monday. All right, uh, that's enough of that. Let's go over votes. Uh, we did have two uh, quick little weekly polls that passed, uh, one for the ratification poll for Phoenix Labs funding and the other for decreasing the uh, uh, rocket belief uh, dust parameter. Um, so we will be working those into an upcoming executive, but as you can see below, we do not have one scheduled for next week. Uh, so we're probably looking at the 22nd on, on those. Um, we do need a bit of help uh, passing this current executive if you support it. So do take a look at that. I've got the long list of changes there, uh, some important stuff, including uh, budgets, parameter changes, uh, delegate compensation, all that good stuff. There was around 50,000 MKR supporting last I checked, which means we, we still do need uh, several tens of thousands more of MKR to, to pass it before uh, uh, that can go on chain, or that can execute rather. All right, that is enough babbling from me. I'm going to hand over the mic to our MIP editors. I believe I am joined by Bob Lowe today to tell you what's going on on his end. That's correct. Hello, everyone. Long time no see, Paulo here with a new uh, weekly MIPS update. As Peyton just mentioned, we had on one short notification poll for the Phoenix Labs initial funding, which went on chain on Monday and closed today. And it was ratified. So uh, 50,000 die are going to be allocated for the initial funding of Phoenix Labs. Uh, moving on, uh, the formal submission window closed today. We are looking to have uh, 18, I think, ratification polls going up on Monday and running for two weeks. So let's see what those are. We have a MIP 4C2 that is an amendment to expand the facilitator definition to allow entities. Uh, building of that one, we have uh, entities applying to become facilitators for protocol engineering and for risk, prototype labs and BA labs and one further facilitator onboarding for retro to facilitate uh, collateral engineering services. Uh, we have multiple coordinate budgets. We went into detail on these two calls ago. Uh, there's also two protocol day transfers for uh, Starnet Engineering and DevOps, and the special purpose fund uh, for the launch of Sparkland. Uh, we have a fault setting adjustment proposal for MIP 92, that is the MIP that onboards PSM USDC to JARN. Um, we have MIP 101 through MIP 114, which make up the Maker Constitution MIP, uh, MIP set, sorry, plus MIP 102C2 SP1, which is going to be bundled in the ratification poll for it. Um, MIP 102C2 SP1 uh, is uh, an amendment MIP that introduces a large number of changes 
Uh, it has been reviewed on the previous general call. And we have MIP 116, which proposes instant instantiation of a D3M to provide liquidity for a Spark Lent. Um, finally, we have a mandate change for uh, SiteStream Auto Services, which is also changing its name to SiteStream Automation Services. Uh, these proposals will have the ratification polls going on chain on Monday 13 and running for two weeks. And yeah, that's it for me, a shorter than usual presentation. I hope you all appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome, uh, much appreciated, Pablo. Uh, obviously it's gonna be a super busy uh, polling week starting on Monday. So I uh, do recommend people start checking out polls as soon as they're able if they're uh, planning on voting. Awesome, and that will bring us into our initiative updates. Uh, really happy uh, Dennis from Ducks agreed to come on on, on such short notice to talk about uh, some updates that they put on the forum yesterday. Uh, Dennis, you on the call? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Peyton. Hey, everyone. Um, Dennis here with Ducks. Uh, just wanted to briefly mention that uh, based on the, yeah, let's say highly controversial and high profile, high impact, high everything, all that's coming up on Monday, we've been collaborating with TechOps to uh, try and see if we can, yeah, take some, uh, some, some steps to make the voting portal a little bit more resilient in light of the vote. So there's a few things we're, we're going to do. Obviously, we're going to be uh, like uh, on call. We're going to do, uh, yeah, we're going to be very attentive. Uh, we're going to increase the frequency of tests and monitoring and all that kind of stuff. We're going to increase some of the resources uh, related to the, to the infrastructure during the vote. Uh, some things that should be relevant for you all is that um, in case you do run into any issues with voting uh, when, the, when the poll is live, we created a temporary um, channel called voting support on the MakerDAO Discord. If there's any issue at all, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out there and drop some information. And then, uh, yeah, technical folks will be uh, will be around shortly to help. So, Docs and Tech Ops are going to be on call watching that channel. Uh, another thing that we're working on, just in case, just in case we end up with the worst case scenario, um, we're working on some documentation on how to manually vote using EtherScan. So, in case the voting portal is unavailable um, for, for some reason. We're going to do everything to make sure that's not going to happen. But in case that happens, know that um, also Maker's polling system is, is on-chain. Uh, so you can interact with the with the polling contract on-chain um, and then you can submit your vote and then um, that vote will be registered on the blockchain um, even if the voting portal is down. So expect that post to be uh, uh, shared today. We'll share it in this uh, forum thread that uh, Peyton is now showing on your screen. We'll also drop it in the voting support channel and we'll make sure to add some links to the uh, voting portal as well for future reference. Uh, yeah, that's all for now. Awesome, we really appreciate the update, Dennis. Um, and I know this it seems dumb, but sometimes it's hard to find channels in the uh, Discord. So if you are looking for that, uh, it's under the working tab. Uh, and the channel name again is voting support. Uh, so huge thanks to Dex, uh, Tech Ops, all, all the collaborations that are going on there. Um, really, really appreciate uh, you making sure our, our infrastructure is safe. And uh, yeah, uh, Gabalpa has <laughs> tested out on, on Gorelli uh, with, with, with voting for, for polls just to see how it works via Etherscan. And I was able to figure it out, which gives me high hopes for others should the worst case scenario happen. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously we're taking all the steps to make sure that people can vote as normal. Uh, so there aren't any unexpected uh, hiccups along the way. Cool. Uh, not seeing any questions. I will pause for one more moment just in case, uh, but otherwise we can move on to discussion. Excellent. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, Ducks, for coming on and let us know. Uh, please do utilize that channel if we need it. Okay, so that will bring us to our discussion segment. Um, as I was telling those of you who joined the call earlier today, uh, not sure how much this group wants to discuss. There are uh, obviously in-game focus calls uh, three times a week, usually for several hours, uh, but 
given that the vote is about to come up and uh, Gavalpa is always answering lots of questions uh, just in general on on, on voting matters. Uh, we figured it would be good to offer this space uh, if people did want to discuss any questions they still have about the maker constitution that's going up uh, or just generally any, any uh, kind of governance related points. Uh, obviously uh, on runes and game calls, that's uh, kind of a a much more pointed audience, right? It's a, a group of people that are gathering to hear and discuss about the uh, in-game plans through through the decentralized voter committees. Um, you know, our job as GovAlpha is to kind of hold the space as, as a, a neutral community uh, outpost. We're getting questions answered, we're asking questions, uh, for uh, commenting on on ways you you are noticing how the the protocol is operating, and and maybe want to a more insight into. Uh, so I think it's important that we offer this space. Uh, should anyone have any questions about the Maker Constitution or anything further that they want to discuss? Um, but I also do understand if there's a lot of fatigue around the subject. Uh, but hopefully that gives you some idea on why I still decided to could go forward with it. And uh, yeah, I would just open the floor if people have questions, if they want to make statements on on how they plan to be voting on the Constitution. That, that might be a great way to, to kick off a uh, topic as well. But uh, yeah, I'll see the floor and shut up for a few moments and see if anyone pipes up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, seen a comment from uh, Frontier Research, one of our recognized delegates, uh, about talking about actual next steps. Like, hey, if this thing were to pass, uh, what will happen? Um, there's obviously a, a huge uh, chunk of, of change <laughs> that uh, uh, gets implemented. Um, but kind of the the most immediate effects, is, I, I would say, uh, is, is kind of the suspending of the uh, previous governance paradigm, right? Like the the main effect of in game is to say, okay, no more MIPS. Instead, we're gonna go through these scopes. Uh, we're gonna fund things like this, and and this is how it's gonna happen. Um, there are several core units, right? They they have budgets that are that are going up. Um, if in game passes basically instructs uh, governor's facilitators to to ignore uh, all, all the other ones that might pass. Um, but in-game itself does have uh, several line item uh, funding items. Uh, so in terms of what happens immediately is probably sorting that out, uh, getting those all into an exec and making sure that uh, the dictated funding streams are are available for, for people that need them. Um, but kind of, like I said, the, the main shift in, in terms of the community like you go from having one set of rules for, for how you apply government changes to, to a new set of rules. Um, and we can spend <laughs> quite a while uh, detailing those, but, but I think that's at least high level what, what the most important thing to grasp is, is that if in-game passes, both the MIPS that are going up with it, uh, as well as uh, future MIPS uh, or future proposals in, in this case, uh, will will be dictated through through the scopes rather than uh, through the MIP zero framework that that people are used to. I've seen some good questions in chat. Did anyone want to vocalize those? If not, I'm happy to read them out. Uh, more of a comment from uh, 3F delegate. Assuming you could hear me. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I think. As a community, we need to look at the state of the industry right now, the ecosystem, and it's just, it's not much happening. Um, I think there was a second there we felt that there was a little bit of momentum going, but now you're seeing just, um, you know, uh, outside of what happened with Silvergate the last 24 hours, you just, I just don't see any attraction um, to the ecosystem happening, even being at East Denver. There's a lot of brilliant people, which I love to see trying to figure out DAO governance and coming up with all kinds of tooling, thinking about how things could be done more efficiently, uh, wondering how we could unite for one common good. All great things happening. Um, a lot of stuff on zero knowledge proofs, which you love to see, you know, CK, EVMs, galores, I can't even count them anymore. So I think since we are in crypto winter and maybe perhaps we might have gotten a little gullible over the last 30 days that we're going to work our way out of it and interest rates are going to finally calm down and stay flat or at least retract. Maybe this is just the time to make the pivot and 
embrace the maker constitution as something that is going to help us go to the next phase of decentralized finance. And if that pertains to what the maker constitution is asking for, this end game ecosystem of sub DAOs and ecosystem actors that are going to yell together and build a bunch of ecosystems all over the place that's going to allow community members of MakerDAO to go outside of the DAO and even work for someone uh, like uh, what have you, ABC Protocol, and still participate in the MakerDAO endgame ecosystem. I mean, that's that's just huge. Like, we could do two things. We could stay stagnant and just wait and wait <laughs> and hope that, you know, money comes back into DeFi, but I, I just don't see it, man. Like the, the the doors are just closing everywhere and it's time to iterate on what was built already in 2020, 2021 and just do it better and just make it more, um, more friendlier and hopefully get some of that, that real world money to come back to, to DeFi the way it was starting to gain that traction in 2021. You know, I was reading, I was reading today an article on how fixed rate protocols were going to be the next big thing. Um, it was an article written by Masari in I think the spring of 2021 when the bull market was going. And here we are in the spring of, well, not quite yet, but the spring of 2023. And it's it's just dead, right? Like you can't even compare the fixed the fixed market in the real world, which is trillions of dollars compared to what DeFi has right now. So we're just a speck uh, in the whole universe. And I think this is there's no better time, in my opinion, than just to get out there and just build something new, something unique, something that gets the community excited. And perhaps as the author of the Maker Constitution says, it will melt faces. I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but we won't find out until we try. So yeah, I just, just wanted to say that before we go into this vote next week. And um uh, you know, I think we need to do the right thing and 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 get something new going and 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 get some excitement back. Like make governance fun again somehow, some way. Appreciate the perspective, Frank. And uh, I do see another recognized delegate uh, from Sable Labs that uh, do with your hand up. You want to take it away? Uh, yes. Um, and thank you, um, you know, Frank, for your comment. I do want to also touch on the part that Frank mentioned, um, you know, being united. I think it's very important to kind of understand that being united, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you have to be the same person, right? The idea of, um, you know, people with you know, different ideas, Maybe some different ideals, but they um, unite you know, for uh, the same vision. And I think that we're probably going to see that um, with the um, upcoming voting as well. Uh, I know that there might be some that are a little skeptical or have some concerns, but I think that it's, uh, I think it's also um, you know, very important that um, just because somebody has a concern, um, you know, doesn't necessarily make them you know, enemies, right? But at the same time, it's also very important how we um, you know, treat such you know, opinions and also, um, you know, for those who support uh, the constitution and also how we you know, communicate um, you know, with, it, um, with all. So I just want to say that um, whatever the outcome, we should respect it. And um, even if some, let's say, disagree, I think it's important to understand that we're all we're here for the same mission and um, we should, you know, uh, we should definitely communicate and heal. That's really nice to hear how uh, you delegates who, who have to vote on this are, are processing it and, and approaching it. People think of other comments or questions. Um, I did see a thread in here asking like how exactly the implementation will happen uh, given all the dictated like budget changes, like stream authorizations, all, all that stuff. and. Yeah, we are kind of fully expecting to, to split it into multiple execs. Like we'll obviously see uh, when when it comes down to it exactly what is possible. But uh, you know, part of the intangible <laughs> the difficulty with with uh, governance facilitating is when governance says, "Hey, we want to do all this stuff," and then you have a limited team that can actually code that stuff. Uh, you have to negotiate, like, okay, uh, what are we going to prioritize first? Uh, and then you also have Block limitations if, if you are doing a, a whole bunch of complex actions. Um, 
which unfortunately tends to be the case anytime uh, you're you're messing with, with streams that already exist in the wild. Um, because yeah, there are just all sorts of things that can happen between when you're planning to write it and and when the spell actually gets executed. Uh, then I'm sure P could detail better than I could. But, uh, <laughs> happy to give my novice uh, opinion. And I do see another hand from Paper Imperium, uh, one of the uh, representatives from GFX Labs. Where can I sell you uh, paper? Where? Take it away. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank Du for those comments because I, I think that's I think that's going to be really important because this is. We expect this to be a really contentious vote, um, and you know, we—it's no secret we will be opposing it and be working to uh, get others to oppose it as well. Um, but we do share Dew's uh, thoughts that, regardless of the outcome, uh, people should should move on. Right. So uh, we think this is an unworkable constitution. We think it's bad. Like there's just no sugarcoating it. But if it does by some miracle pass. Um, then we will do our best to fix the broken parts of it rather than try to be obstructionists. Thanks, Paper. Um, and I will say as governance facilitator, that's something that's always been really uh, incredible to me. It's witnessing just how much uh, faith in, in the governance vote to exist in the community. Right, It makes it much easier to operate governance when when people are are very willing to 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 trust the process and uh, you know honor the results, um, so really appreciate commitments on on both sides to that getting into a a likely controversial vote. Kind of hinted. I know there's there's a high risk of, of fatigue on the subject, um, but we do want to give the space for for those that want to take it. Um, so yeah, we'll give a call. That if no one says anything for a few minutes, we'll go ahead and end the call. Uh, but if there are questions, concerns, things you want to talk about um, before the vote starts, this this is uh, you know there's this there's a TVC call later today, uh, but. After that, uh, the vote goes live on Monday and lasts for two weeks, so there aren't a lot of uh, chances left if, if you do have an opinion or, or something you want to want to work out in regards to the Constitution. Yeah, I kind of kind of wanted to mention that I did hear a couple of DAOs and one of Eve Denver are also have also um, I can't remember the names. Apologies for that, but have have already instituted constitution. So this is, you know, this is not something groundbreaking here that's happening. And while I agree with the uh, paper that the constitution might not be perfectly um, written, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, there is ways for you to ratify it. And MIP 102 is still gonna be around, right? So a lot of things that are going to initially not be correct or align with the mission statement uh, of the constitution can can be ratified later on. So I, I'm not worried about that. Uh, but just wanted to point out that, and maybe Peyton, maybe you remember some folks you met out there, but I'm pretty sure there's a couple of them that in the last uh, uh, three to six months have instituted, uh, have implemented, I should say, a constitution uh, into their DAO. So th this is not groundbreaking whatsoever, in my opinion. Yeah, I am really not sure on the timing, but we did on there was a cool governance meetup where it was like entirely uh, focused on on constitutions, right? And how to fill fill a good one, like what they're based on. Uh, we heard some feedback from like Bankless was there talking about how you know the constitution has and and hasn't serves served them. Um, but yeah, it does seem to be a, a growing theme among a lot of organizations just to have kind of a supreme uh, thing to to describe it. And I'm seeing a hand from uh, another recognized delegate, uh, Kianga from Acre Invest. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Peyton. Hi, everyone. I I just wanted to encourage those who are deciding on the vote to think about the many, many, many people who are not necessarily participating vocally in the debate. So I know a lot of this has been framed as like, you know, 
what Rune has done and seizing control and then the whales and what the whales are afraid of losing their influence. And I, I just want to give a shout out <laughs> to all the hours that have gone into this moment and people who are unseen, who who actually have contributed to shaping what's coming up for the vote. And that to vote against the constitution, and many of you know that Acre Vest uh, was very com <laughs> combative, voted against anything to do with Endgame at every turn last year. We even started to abstain when we just threw a tantrum and we stopped voting, you know, all the, our participation metrics tanked and we, you know, all of that. So I hope it, I don't know if it means anything to those who are opposed today. I just want to say, you know, obviously I get that, but I also think that where we are now in March of 2023, a lot of people have left the community you know, the ones who are left to just personally want to applaud you. And um, for those who want to vote against the constitution, you know, to, to Frank's point, there's, there, there's a mechanism to just continue to make the more granular changes of the things that one may think are broken. Um, there's going to continue to be the same governance system. So, Anyone today who has tokens and wants to vote will continue to be able to do so. They don't have to participate in the um, constitutional delegate selection process. Um, and so I just think that the cost of the morale is too high. And I would just encourage those who are thinking of voting against it over kind of however the power dynamics are playing out upstairs. <laughs> Imagine if you were to vote for it and there was this unification of the whales. Like how, what a powerful signal that would be to the market about the MKR value and the future prospect. And if then the, the battles took place more granularly, but we could finally end this purgatory that I think the community has been in the past year or plus and um, have the alignment that I think is crucial and is in the best interests of even those who oppose the plan. So that's my plug for um, maybe seeing something very surprising, which is all of those who are thinking of voting against actually unifying and saying, okay, we hate this, but we're voting for it because we're voting for the work that's gone into it. We're voting for coming together as a project and that that show of strength and unity is going to, you know, accrue much, much more value in the short, medium and long term than the kind of Pyrrhic victory of, you know, wrecking the whole um, project that that's brought us to this point. I think the time for that passed. We have, this is a constitution, let's make no mistake, that was written by one man who holds a lot of maker and has continued to buy, you know, more than $10 million worth of maker ahead of this vote, rather than seeking out support from other maker holders. The chance to compromise was in the past, I would love to return to uh, an environment where compromise is possible. But the signals have been consistently that it's his way or the highway. And that is, you know, the, the, I, I think that it, we're just, we're, I would love to de-escalate things here, but, you know, it's hard to do that when, uh, you know, he's armed himself I, to the I, teeth I, with more maker and has publicly, I, I've suffered personal attacks being called a liar and a snake in public channels by him repeatedly. So, you know, I, I'm willing to sit at the table with him and work through the, the specifics because you know, the reason there was not such urgency in the past was that we were still dealing with a conceptually high level. And then, you know, as the I think it came out in the meeting yesterday, he views all these parameters that he's just arbitrarily inserting as placeholders 
but a lot of them wreck existing business relationships or have real effects on the protocol. And an unwillingness to just have all of those broken out into separate votes, you know, say, here's the Constitution, all these things will be filled in next month, right? As opposed to, here's a random number I'm going to throw down because I think it's it's a round number or it's the one I think should be it. And then after things break, you can try to push through proposals that will fix these things. Some things, some things are like Humpty Dumpty. They can't be put back together. Paper, I hear you. I feel you. I, I, I completely understand and can relate to where you're coming from. You know, here's just what I'll say. You know, as problematic as you're framing Rune's conduct is like almost equally problematic to hear you say, I want this. I am telling all of you what's broken. I have offered to sit down with Rune. Like why? That That is also challenging framing in which to sort of offer an alternative. And so I, I just wanted to, I mean, I, I, I acknowledge all of what you're saying, but I, I, I want to push back a little bit on the idea. I, I get the dictator thing and the Rune Radio thing. I mean, I've been critical about that as well. But we also, a part of that dynamic that's occurred is that a lot of people just really cannot speak out. Like the, the dynamics are too political. They, you know, they're at the mercy of, you know, large delegators, delegates who have large, you know, token backings and whatever influence. So we also, I think, should recognize we're not necessarily getting a great sense of who supports what, who has actually contributed behind the scenes to what. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I admit I grant a lot of what you're saying, um, but I just suggesting that like the, your posture here is also in my mind, like not where we want to go as a community where it's sort of like you get to say, I'm the one who, who, who sits across the table from Brune. And it's, it's still not the kind of decentralized, you know, community um, participatory conversation. So that, so I, I just want to make that point and, and, and really try and speak or, or highlight that there are voices here and there's been work done and contributions made and, and it's not visible. And it's, it's been made, I think, you know, other comments yesterday in the call, um, retro speak, uh, pr presentation at, 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 uh, ETH Denver, which was, you know, I think really articulated well, like the damage that the politics have done and the silencing effect that it's had. And that's like, that's not only Rune, that's also, I think the way the recognized delegate program has unfolded as well. So I just think there's just many more opinions than, than we can even hear because it just would be unwise and unsafe as we've seen people in the workforce and that's primarily who's here right as frank was speaking about the, the crypto winter we're in we don't have too many people around who are just here for fun we have the people who are here kind of working and and so then that leaves folks like us and then there's there there are people who this is like their livelihood and full-time job battling for their their businesses and their careers and their lives so i mean they, they're not necessarily in a great position to contribute to the conversation. So I'm not convinced that there's not the buy-in that that maybe it it the way it's being presented. And I and I think it's distressing that the solution you're proposing is that you know you you be the the spokesperson for like all the institutional investors and the whole community to like negotiate what should be for the make or doubt ecosystem. It's Kianga and I think uh, Konaita, Paper Sipta, go ahead, so take it away. Yeah, um, so I wanted to address kind of the big issue I'm seeing with this constitution in the discussion is there's a lot of focus on us, on um, how does this affect you know delegates, how does this affect CUs, and not, and it's taking away focus from how it affects the protocol. Like, you know, when Rune talked about, or when Paper just talked about, um, you know, we have these partners who are going to be getting, you know, having partnerships that are seriously damaged 
by these placeholder parts of the constitution, that's like, that's something that's going to impact the protocol significantly. And that, that really is the, should be the focus. And that's why we need to have these things correct and more incrementally then more incrementally so that our partners and our die holders can be the focus and not, um, Oh, well, how does this impact me as a delegate? Or how does this impact the CU guy? I, I think that's a big issue with the constitution. So it's very inwardly focused and it's taking away a lot of time and attention that the DAO should be spending on the protocol itself. Thanks, Cody. I was kind of reflecting on the, uh, the notion that, uh, I don't know how to necessarily frame this, but like uh, uncertainty is kind of bad for for anyone, right? So like in terms of if you want to uh, like get things done, <laughs> um, unless you're you're trying to take over a system, then perhaps uncertainty is is to your favor. But like uh, you were mentioning it in in terms of our our partners, right? Code night, and we think of like uh, Rema mentioned in the chat some of the uh, the changes that will happen to decentralized collateral. There's a number of changes uh, that will happen to real world assets collateral as well. You know, all sorts of things that are uh, kind of uncertain based on on how the vote goes and and how much is worked into the proposal. Um, that just kind of caused me to reflect on the core unit side that uh, a lot of people have been uh, struggling and complaining about that uncertainty as well, because it's this idea of like, if, if people know what the rules are, then they can go forward and, and play with the rules. But in a time when rules are changing, uh, it becomes a lot harder to the trust that uh, there's, there's still going to be follow through afterwards. Um, so I appreciate that comment. So nine and kind of made me reflect about like <laughs> operationally, like you know maybe uh, there are a few things we can we can do better uh, in, in any big big governance vote, but uh, particularly the the uncertainty I think took a toll on on all stakeholders uh, with this one. I'm taking a look at the chat here. If one has something to shout out or ask or uh, whatever, please go for it. Otherwise, I'm going to scroll and maybe call one of these up. I see a good question from Water. I'll get to it in a moment. Um, but did want to bring up the uh, GNR since Patrick mentioned that earlier and it kind of came up uh, again in the chat with Kianga's comment. Um, that is like another change that didn't feel as important in the grand scheme of things, but it's probably super relevant to this audience that one of the things uh, the constitution does as well is kind of gets rid of this, this weekly uh, governance and risk call. Um, and that's because instead it will be the scopes people who are, are actually strategizing and, and trying to come together and, and discuss uh, what should be done that uh, that will kind of be holding the calls. Obviously, what's really cool about a decentralized org is like we, we could still host the GNR if we wanted to, right? It, it may not be a, an official one, but if community members want to get together and talk about all the issues every week, like there's, there's no stopping you. Um, but it does kind of remove that former requirement that, okay, the governor's facilitator and, and all these other people have to come in and make announcements and, and do that sort of thing for, for the GNR. Um, so worth kind of like calling that out in implications uh, there too. Um, so Water asks a question in chat that I kind of previewed a second ago asking if Rune has expressed how he expects the day to day to change if the vote passes. Um, I don't know. If Juan or Patrick or someone else uh, might be able to answer that uh, better than I can. If not, I can take a, a stab at it. Cool. So, yeah, that is kind of the hard part of the question. At one point, so it's like the day to day for who, depending on what role you take, it's going to change quite a bit. But um, for Rune's perspective, I, I would kind of provide that uh, he sees this as kind of like pushing the day-to-day -to, -day to be in-game focus, right? Whereas like right now, 
we had the, the like pre pre game, I guess we could call it now, uh, vote back in October that kind of said, okay, we want to work on X, Y, and Z and, and establish this. Um, but realistically, not a ton had really changed since then. So I think Rune kind of used this as like the the kind of like concrete uh, directional signal that hey, if this passes with with a lot of support, uh, it's quite clear that the the day to day will shift entirely to end game, and there won't be any more of this question of like should should core units be working on this, even though their mandate says X Y Z, but uh, in game wants them to do uh, this instead. So in terms of the day to day, I think it will give most parties more clarity uh but depending on what your role is in the ecosystem uh you know it, it might change drastically or it might not change much at all my uh, question mostly relates to the specific values of for example the parameters that are in the scope frameworks um i would guess that it's, it's specifically those that cause concern in the in the short term uh, so um for those i i think um you know the, in any case there is too much in the constitution and the scope frameworks to implement everything from day one so priorities will have to be set anyway and an easy way to alleviate the concerns might be to simply uh, focus on the the high level framework first. Have those CVCs convene, have their subcommittees convene, um, make do another read through of the of the scope frameworks, and then before the individual scope frameworks are implemented, uh, have another vote to, for example, tweak those parameters that are problematic. Uh, it's yeah. I guess it depends on how you interpret what what the MKR vote means, like whether you can do that or not. But um, as I said, like the the practical reality is that we'll have to prioritize anyway. And so why not change? Like why not start with the with the correction mechanisms first, and then apply already one round of that to the individual parameter values? I think. Um, yeah, I think it will be uh, uh, it will be a requirement anyway. In reality, like you, you can't go and, and suddenly change everything um, from a very practical point of view. So um, that might be one way to look at. It. I think that is a cool approach. I think, like all else being equal, we probably <laughs> approach it the same way we do today, which is like, okay, let's look at what. Governance is approved. Let's work at what work is done, and let's look at you know what interactions uh, is left of the work uh, that that still needs to be done. Um, you know, and and the reality, uh, at least in terms of how we uh, in the past process complex like a uh, need for change would essentially be to have a an elected facilitator say, hey, uh, MK, our governance voted for this. We should implement XYZ first, and that's what I'm recommending first. Um, I think the responsible facilitator framework uh, kind of mirrors that to to a certain extent. So uh, at least my approach would probably be, oh, if, if I was not giving anything else by, by MKR holders, would be to approach the scope, say, hey, your scope, uh, you know, addictics, all this works needs to be done. And this all be done at once, and if not, like what needs to be done first? Um, but <laughs> I think if we we could have a higher level input of, of the correction mechanisms, like you were talking about, water, that would, that would certainly be a, a more effective way to to, to roll it out. Because uh, otherwise, we'll just be rolling out whatever is is ready first, which tends to be the the stuff that's um, either not super impactful or impactful, but easy to change, like setting a debt ceiling to, to zero, for instance. A lot of good back and forth in the chat. Did anyone want to come on the mic? Otherwise, I can 
but you're the, the summary of what you're trying to say. Sure, Payne, I'll give a quick summary of what I've been saying in the chat. Um, <clears throat> just that the way I read the um, dynamics between the constitutional delegates and the CBCs, so we won't have the GNR, um, I guess, to your point, Peyton, which was excellent, there's nothing to stop anyone from keeping these going in a sense, right? Um, similarly, I think with the quote core unit office hours, you know, that forum for questions, discussions, I don't see any reason that has to change. But what I see is that the, the CVCs are designed to host, you know, whatever the number is, 12 meetings a month or something like that. And that to whoever was commenting that we spent all this time talking about kind of the high level political things and we don't get to some of the details often in these meetings in the substance, that's in my mind what the constitution solves for. So now there are dedicated meetings for each of the scopes. And yeah, in the future, however we kick it off, there's going to be multiple CVCs with different you know, policy views that are covering the same topics and the delegates are specifically kind of designed to attend those meetings. And that's like the work that they're getting paid for is to join those meetings and follow the discussion um, and translate. And in, in those meetings also would be the ones that proposers, you know, people who want to do business with the DAO are attending those meetings. and. I think the the big gap, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the call, long proposed like, you know, the, the coordination of some of the legwork and heavy lifting of, of, of keeping track of the calls, depending on who someone is in the ecosystem, like where should they have a converse, join the conversation about this or that. But in my mind, you know, the, the big boost in, um, you know, compensation or the view for this these newly re resourced delegates is that that's your opportunity to add the most value which is actually attending these meetings and that in this new structure we can finally kind of depoliticize in some in some of the some of the dynamics and instead you can have people a little bit more aligned who want to talk with each other in their more subcommittee groups zero in on issues then they're proposed like detailed solutions that are presented in a context like that's the huge also I think win for this structure is that instead of being like reactive to like all this stuff that just flies at us and then we, we really can't get a view of how different proposals maybe should relate with one another you know with the scopes you're constantly needing to see every proposed change in, in a kind of context. And so the delegates in my mind are gonna be absolutely crucial because the conversation that happens in all the subcommittee meetings would be like the MKR representatives and people wanting to do business with the DAO. You know, they, they're not gonna understand the structure or like where, where their objectives need to fit within the framework. And so that in my mind is the new role for the delegates. It's it's not to broker deals or like help outsiders position themselves. It's just literally to like provide that service. It's a very, very different model. But I, I, I think it's incorrect to say like suddenly the delegates have nothing to do and can't talk to anyone. They're just not to be these sort of external power brokers. They're meant to just be these constitutional protectors and be the ones that help the rubber meet the road. Thanks, Kiaga. It's uh, really good to hear uh, that perspective and really inspires a few people to think about how they can uh, kind of contribute value, right? Uh, I see a hand from, from you again. Take it away. Yeah, I just want to also mention that um, I think the one thing that, I mean, I'll say that there are many things that delegates didn't um, do well, including myself. I am guilty of it, but I think that um, um, oh, there are certain things that um, um, trying to, for example, you know, give some criticism or trying to talk about the budgets and things like that, right? And then for those from um, what I understand is the within CBC, you can still express it. Um, uh, uh, there was some you know questions about like how active they can be. 
because I also looked at the clause about um, they cannot be politically active in like in a certain way. But I think that at least within CBC, you can still voice them. And I think it's very important for delegates to be you know, critical if needed. Um, you know, within those CBC, right? Because I think that um, especially you know if you're working together, then usually you don't want to give you know give those criticism, right? You just want to you know, go along, be friends. But I think it's important from the both incentive as you know, as well as um, looking at the structure that um, you know, such will also need it. So I do hope to see that even in the future, the such, I would say, um, you know, ability is still maintained. Thanks, Dean. Uh, and yeah, to kind of reinforce some of the comments, at least how Kavalfa is interpreting it, right, is like, hey, delegates are mandated to attend a lot of these meetings with other ecosystem actors. So it seems that the text is saying that any non-public communication is is what's being banned rather than like public communication at man mandated calls. Um, but yeah, well, I'm sure <laughs> the, the like kind of neat thing about the, the arbitration scope um, is like eventually like a, a case law will just develop because these challenges will happen, right? People will say, hey, no, I went to challenge. But like it says quite clearly here, no inter interaction. And this is an interaction. So make a ruling. Um, and then unlike now where, um, I'd like, I'd like to think that GovAlpha does a good job at least like publicly announcing, like when we, we, we make judgment calls, right? I'd like to think that we do a good job of at least saying, Hey, uh, you know, if you're paying attention to this issue, uh, you, you might see why we decided the thing that we did. Um, but there's no like developing case law. There's no like, uh, kind of body of work, um, other than an institutional memory. Uh, so that's at least one one side of, of my job where, where I see uh, a potential improvement in, in end game. And I see a hand from a wider one, take it away. Uh, what I was wondering if anywhere there has been already some kind of schedule as to in which order the different scopes would be discussed by the subcommittees. It, it is. Um, it, 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 they all have a specific week. Hmm. It's in the uh, it was someone in the documents. There's like a actually it's very explicit. You there's a 12 week rotating schedule, and you talk about one scope each week. Would someone have the link by any chance? Like of the specific schedule, like which one is up first? And that's what I personally would just focus on is like let's get the first one discussed and prepared and tackled, then move on to the next one. So the first week is stability and liquidity. And then the second week is decentralized collateral. I linked it. It's a 4.5.1. Kada, Kona, and yeah, did see a response there that like uh, ecosystem actor is uh, is it defined? Uh, I do believe it's defined in the constitution itself. Um, so, aren't they changed now? Did not ecosystem actor is like professional actor or something like that? Yeah. Anyway, but yes, the the definition does it go somewhere? I think I saw a good question in here from yeah from fig asking uh how many people will fail the delusion with the DAO when this passes um hard question to answer perhaps but uh, if people want to share their personal feelings that would be welcome um i can say from the gov alpha side right uh i have been hearing from from multiple sides but a lot of people are are kind of like happy that it is coming to a vote right just to, the DAO will finally have some clarity of like, okay, there's there's a vote date. By this date, we'll know if, if this is, you know, who we're really leaning in and, and committing to this or not. Um, so I would say, well, that doesn't mean you you can't also be disillusioned and feeling that way. Uh, the, the general feedback I've been getting is that people kind of feel like, it, it, you know, this has been going on for a while. So there will be some relief in, in finally having a vote. 
Uh, see a hand from from do again. Yep, sorry. Um, I just want to give a comment that I don't think there's any illusion about it, to be honest, because I think that um, we have realized that we're here to um, you know, help the protocol. We never thought that, for example, the treasury belongs to us, right? Like, you know, it's, um, well, it's supposed to use for the protocol and then, you know, the orders, um, you know, themselves. Uh, I know that maybe there were some, maybe, um, you know, members that maybe misunderstood that way, but it was never supposed to be, right? And then I think that that's the same for vision. The vision is like, sure, we can maybe help with it, but at the, in the end of the day, it's really the holders that present such vision, and they're also the ones that will, you know, vote for it. And I don't think that that's the part that we had in the illusion about. Yeah, Thanks, here. I, uh, I did not mean to have my hand raised, but since uh, no one else is talking, can read out my comments anyway. So um, I so going by the schedule, I think that gives something very practical to work with. And um, one way of that uh, we could go about this from a, from a practical point of view is to see the first round of CVC uh, subcommittee meetings as an exploration of the given scope framework where um, just general concerns and questions are uh, collected. And then in the second round, uh, the next quarter to uh, prepare for the first, um, or by the second round, uh, have the uh, the first like concrete strategy prepared with the, with the changes to the framework. And then after those changes are voted through, uh, implement the, the actual rules of the scope framework. And that would be an example of having the correction mechanism play out first with, a, I think, somewhat reasonable timeline because it gives 12, week, 12 weeks of uh, preparing uh, any any uh, practical strategy to uh, to be voted on. Um, so that might be a very practical way of approaching it. And yeah, I, for me, like, I, I also feel that there is a huge, um, like a mismatch between the way that the MIPS process is supposed to be very explicit and exact, and um, the reality that the only way to to interpret uh, the the MIPS that are currently presented is is in a um, is in a way more pragmatic uh, fashion. And I, but I just think that's something we need to accept and um, focus our efforts on finding a, a practical, pragmatic. Uh, way of of um, yeah following the spirit of what is proposed, but uh, um, applying some flexibility in the timing of the details, and uh, allow for those details to be adjusted and corrected before they are turned into uh, executive votes. So uh, at least that that's how I would approach it. I think that's good feedback and gives us something to to maybe grab onto. Because um, I think that's fairly consistent with uh, at least some of what Rune has, right? Because the ecosystem actors uh, or ecosystem, the incubating ecosystem actors, I, I believe is the correct term, the people that we're going to fund through the ecosystem scope. Uh, for instance, if the constitution is approved, all of those would go up to vote individually. Um, so I, I do think you know, there is perhaps like a hair more um, desire for like, uh, uh, I guess consensus, yeah, is, is the word I want to use, uh, than, than perhaps uh, has been given credit so far. Um, and I think mechanisms like that, that give us a chance to to further debate things, um, even after the vote are are pretty healthy for, for the org. Yeah, seeing a hand from my, my co-facilitator, Patrick, take away. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm actually going to disagree with both of you. Uh, so, um, like, Rune has been intentional um, when he's writing in these parameter changes. You know, 
there, there's a desire to um, redirect and die generation to more profitable liquidity types, and and that's the rationale behind things like increasing stability fees on vaults. Because what you know, if, if if people aren't going to pay them, okay, fine, um, we won't use those vaults, and instead the die generation is going to be driven by real world assets, and we're going to re- pivot essentially what was the old pigeon stance, which is now something different. Um, but with MIPS, um, I, this is something I've, I've said before as well, you know, they aren't things that you're supposed to rehypothecate after the fact. You know, if you don't agree with what a MIPS says, you should be voting against it. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be saying, oh, well, we'll pass the MIP and then we'll um, try and, you know, smooth out afterwards. Um, you know, to, in a way that that will then be acceptable to me. Um, that's you know a very good way of of, of approaching the process. Um, so if a MIP says you know the stability P for ETH should be X, my perspective is that's what should be going into an executive vote. Um, the example of the incubating ecosystem actors is a specific um, portion of the ecosystem scope. And is the only instance in the, in the entire MIP set where there's a specific um, part which says we should we will vote again on all of these things. And again, that was intentional. So so there's clearly been thought given to this idea of we can rehypothecate and, and reconsider all these things after the MIP passes. And when that's intended by the author to apply, that has been specified. Um, so my view is we should be. In, in 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 an orderly manner, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't just be slamming everything into a single executive. As I said up the thread, I don't think that's practical. And I don't think that's good. But I don't think we're going to have a twelve week period where we're able to rediscuss and reevaluate and re redecide on what everything should be. I think you know we have to take things as written and and um, and implement that as as in the event that this passes. You know, this is what voters have voted for. Um, I think suggesting that voters are voting for things that you know they don't really want implemented is, is isn't isn't really the right way to be going about it. Yeah. Fully agree there. And uh yeah, uh, I guess my comment was more just to imply that uh, I I've heard many on the opposition side kind of say, oh Rune doesn't take feedback and I, you know, there <laughs> there are things you can point to uh, to to support that claim. Uh but generally speaking, I would say that there there are like some some clear method where he says, hey, I want there to be feedback on this. I want there to be clear consensus on this. Um, and kind of leveraging that that desire might might result in us being able to um, kind of come with a more formal process for, for implementation. Yeah, to, <laughs> to your pun, it's going to be a little bumpy. Uh, I think no matter how we do it, then... Uh, can say I'm pretty sure I speak for Patrick and myself when I say like we we appreciate the community's trust and kind of putting us in the position to um, you know be governance facilitators and this was uh, certainly a, a hard task that we we feel we're up for and uh, really open to feedback uh, on any ways we we can be doing it better. Right. This honestly uh, stirred a pretty good conversation from my perspective, one that went longer uh, than I was perhaps anticipating. Uh, I am noting that we do typically wrap up within the next 15 minutes. So if there are other points, if you feel like we've glossed over something in chat that you would like to make sure makes it onto the recording, uh, now would be your chance to do so. Uh, any last questions, comments, or concerns, let's uh, get them into this and uh, yeah, before we head on with the day. As always, we appreciate all the participation, you guys showing up and uh, having these conversations is what makes the maker community uh, such a wonderful place to be. Uh, let's continue them in the forum and on chat. Uh, and please do reach out uh, if you have any, any feedback uh, from, from today's show. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll be back same time, same place next week at least. Uh, and uh, look forward to chatting then.
Bye, everyone.